Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Sunday Morning Online with Pasadena Church. We're so honored to have you join us today, and we are anticipating a mighty move of God as we worship and as we speak a relevant word for you today. But first, I'd like to express my sadness and, and, and with the news of the passing of Congressman John Lewis, as you all know, um, we, he was just such a mighty, a mighty leader in our country. While at the same time, we're giving thanks to the Lord for blessing our nation with this champion of civil rights, this hero to humanity. And he was a good troublemaker who went to be with the Lord on Friday. Congressman Lewis was 80 years old and um, we will as a nation miss him, miss his leadership. Uh, um, but we're also continuing the legacy that he and others leave behind by remaining true to the cause of justice, God's justice. Amen. And now let's go into a previously recorded worship service and lift the Lord up and celebrate his goodness together. Now y'all got to help us too by clapping those hands. Come on. Everybody clap those hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to see you clapping. Say this, say yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We lift you up. It's a simple song. It goes like this. We say, Lord, we lift you up. We lift you up for all the Higher, say, Lord, we lift you up. We lift you up. 
high. Y'all remember? Lift Jesus higher. You say. Yeah. 
in his presence. The spirit of the Lord is here. And the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I don't know about you, but I want to be free. I want to be free of those traps and tricks that have bond held me in bondage for so long. I want to be free of the schemes and the tricks of the enemy. I want to be free. I want to be free. Anybody else in here want to be free? So just lift up your voice. Whatever your need is, let's raise it up to the Lord, whether it's for your family. God, we speak your loving presence, Father, over families, God. We exalt you, Father, because you are the Lord of the family. We pray, Father, for the children who are here, God, that you would bless them, Father, that you would help them in their studies, God, that you would give them a heart for you above all else, that they would want to please you, God, and no one else. Father, that you, you would give them favor with their teachers, with their classmates. Every time they set their foot somewhere, Father, that that place would be blessed, God. We pray, Father, for every parent represented here, Father, that you would bless them with the strength and the energy to be a good parent, that you would fulfill their souls and fulfill their hearts, Father, that you would give them peace, and Father, above all, give them rest, give them the energy that they need, Father, their grandparents here who are raising babies. There are people who have foster children. There are people who are taking in other families, and God, I just thank you for giving us a church that is so loving that we accept everyone no matter where they are, Father. And even those people who are not married, we pray a special prayer for them, for those who are not married and desire to be so, for those who don't have kids and desire to have them, God. God, we need you. We need you, God, and so we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves in your presence. Receive our praise and our worship, God pleased with our sacrifice in Jesus name hey family the cry of our hearts in this day and in this time is Lord we need you more and we're receiving the invitation from the Lord to run into his presence because we know that he is able to meet every need and I love how Sister Sharla led us in prayer, declaring to God, you are Lord of the family. This is Bible truth. Family is God's idea. His plan is to see the earth filled with his glory and that he is redeeming a family to himself. He's looking for sons and daughters to redeem. This is the promise, that God would be the Father and we would be his sons and daughters, and that all who would accept the work of Jesus would have the right to become children of God. We find this promise in scripture in John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. This is about us being redeemed to him and about being the family that God wants us to represent him in the earth. So I want us to continue to lift up families in prayer. Let's pray now. Father, we thank you that family is your idea. And Father, we're releasing, we're praying just for a release of new grace over families, especially during this time when we are staying home longer because of COVID-19. Father, we're praying that your grace would cover each family member and that there would be such an outpouring of new mercies and forgiveness among family members in your name, Jesus. Father, we're praying that there would be healing over every family. Even now, we call to our attention those family members that need our prayers. Those loved ones in our immediate family, our distant family, and our church family. And I just ask that you would just begin to lift up their names before the Lord and pray for them as I pray. Father, we lift them all up to you. 
those we know that are feeling anxious, those we know that are feeling lonely, those seniors that are feeling isolated, those young people that are feeling distant and isolated from their friends, those of us that are weary and tired just from staying home, Father, those suffering from various addictions, those that have lost income, those just feeling discouraged because of the injustices in our nation. Father, we're praying for those in need of healing over sickness and disease, disease and even this coronavirus. We're praying for a new measure and a release of God's healing power and presence over sick bodies even now. Holy Spirit, touch them and minister to them as only you can. And Father, we lift up the family of Congressman John Lewis, this great civil rights leader in our nation. And we pray that you would comfort his family and comfort us, Lord God, as, as we celebrate his life and as we mourn his loss. May we take up this fight after him, God. We lift our hands and we bow our lives to your authority and we declare that we trust you, Father. Father, we're praying that families would be restored, that there would be a reconnection that would take place in the family, that kids would feel known and loved by their parents, that no person in the family would feel unknown, that every person in the family would feel 100% known, 100% loved, and 100% valued. And Father, we're praying that you would heal the fathers and the mothers in the family. Bind up their broken hearts, heal their wounds. May there be a release of identity, inheritance, and legacy. And Father, release healing over every marriage. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Let go of offenses and be reconciled to one another. May there just be a fresh outpouring of forgiveness between husband and wife. And Father, cause families to dream again together. Release new dreams and families that will cover generations. Remind them of the promises that you spoke over their family line. Even promises you made to their forefathers and mothers that you are wanting to bring them into, Lord. And Father, I'm praying that your sons and daughters would feel your presence right now, the indwelling presence of the Most High God, and that everyone watching would feel your loving embrace, releasing healing and restoration to you right now. May the comfort of the Holy Spirit be upon you, and may he strengthen you in your innermost being. In Jesus' name, let us say amen. the lowly Jesus no
Amen. Praise the Lord to thank you for that wonderful song to our worship team, to our, our band, Salty Chips, Sister Yukumi again leading us. Hallelujah. They put a little spin on it. I grew up with that song and we would say, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And they said, but you could be said, not one. I love it. I love it. Look, look, I just enjoy worshiping the Lord. And, and to, to have this type of celebration today is, makes it a wonderful day. And glad that you're, you're with us today. And I want to share a word that I believe the Lord has given me. Um, it's more of a mandate. It's more of an unction that he's put down in my soul to just continue to press into. And the title is Eracism. Eracism, our message and our mandate. Eracism is our message and our mandate. I just believe in times like these, the Lord is calling the church to take the lead in making sure that we take advantage of everything that's been happening around us, that we won't let this moment pass us by, and that we will take the initiative as the people of God to dismantle, hallelujah, to break down, to erase this terrible racism that has pervaded our nation for over 400 years. And, and as I thought about this, that the Lord's put on my heart, I immediately begin to think about um, growing up again. My childhood memories are always in the forefront of my mind, but I grew up in an era, maybe you did too, where we had crayons, hallelujah. We had chalkboards. We had number two pencils. Hold on, let me get my pencil. Amen. We had number two pencils. Some of y'all don't even know what this is. And we had, my Lord, we had erasers. We had erasers. And we weren't even, we weren't even introduced to pens um, early on because in those early years, we made too many mistakes in pens and, and, and permanent markers. Those now, we didn't, we didn't even deal with those things back then because we were still learning and, and we had so much that needed to be removed erased from our work and be rewritten. And as I thought about this concept of, of eracism and, and how we are called to go in and to, to erase the, the blemish, the, the, terrible, the terrible causes and effects of racism in our world, um, I was thinking about that, that analogy. And, and this is how it usually went. You remember being a child, we had that paper. You know, we had that paper with them thick lines. You might not be able to see those lines, but we had that paper with them thick lines. And our pencils, our first pencils weren't this thin as a matter of fact, they're a little thicker than that. But, but this is how it usually went. We were given an assignment to write something, to write it down. And, and we would start writing and the teacher would come and look at our work. And then a good teacher would ask you the question um, about that work. Are you sure that's how that letter is spelled? Are you sure that sentence is correct? And, and it would make us look a little closer. We'll look at, and, and make sure all oh, that, that, D should be a B or whatever. And we would recognize our error. Other times our teachers would just matter of factly just point it out to us. But nevertheless, they were trying to help us to correct our way. And then we would go, we would get to erasing. Boy, we turn that pencil over and we start erasing the wrong word, the wrong letter, the wrong sentence. You know, sometimes we had to get the big eraser. And, and before you know it, we got all of this dust. We done erased the whole thing because we wanted it to be right. It was a part of our learning process. I hope you hear what I'm saying. It was a part of our, our development. It's a part of helping us to be better in the world that we, we were being introduced to, to be able to read and to write and to do arithmetic. Oh, y'all don't even know about that. But when it comes to racism and everybody probably watching today, you're familiar with racism and what um, the conversations that we're having around our country and even around our world. And I would submit to you that racism as, as we know it in our country is arguably America's biggest error. It's America's biggest error. And I say this because it shouldn't even be a part of humanity's narrative. And furthermore, I believe that it's important for us to stand up, to speak up and to show up, 
to confront and expose the things that terrorize and torment God's people. And we are all God's children. So then racism, beloved, I want you to hear this. And, and some of you may say, wow, pastor, you know, calm down a little bit. Well, this is one of those times that, and this is one of those subjects that's very near and dear to my heart. And I believe God is calling me to speak about it. So I'm just going to go right at it and say to you and everyone watching that racism um, to its core is evil. It has impacted and infected every aspect of America, American society and world history. It has historically contaminated the preaching of the gospel and it's hijacked the message to give unmerited advantage to European colonizers and missionaries who carried it into the world. Yeah, I said that. What are you saying? I'm saying to you and I'm saying especially to the church that it's been a part of our narrative as well. However, I'm reminded of a quote that I heard from Bishop T.D. Jakes just recently who said this. He said, when your missionaries are your masters, the message gets polluted. Yeah. When the missionaries are your masters, the message gets polluted. And, and that's, that's one of the effects that racism has had on our country, the United States of America. And we can go into that history a little later or you can continue to study it on your own. But, but this is important because racism, as we know it, beloved, is a social construct. It was designed by people in order to segment other people by race. And in America, specifically by color. So I'm going to say it here and, and I'm, I'm going to put it on the screen, but I'm going to say it here and I'll unpack it later and, and I'll weave it into much of what I'm going to say today. And, 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 and I'm going to continue until the Lord directs me elsewhere. But you need to know that racism is founded by prejudice, funded by power and policy. It's flourished by privilege but the good news is that it can be foiled by the faithful. Hallelujah. And that's what we're believing God's going to use us to foil, to dismantle, to erase, to erase racism. Come on, just say eracism. Hallelujah. Come on, say it again. Eracism. Amen. That's what God's calling us to do. You may say, well, pastor, that's impossible. But I would say to you what Nelson Mandela said. He said, it's all, it always seems impossible until it's done. Hallelujah. So, so then we must have a kingdom response to racism. I told you last week that the news cycle has moved on and there's other leading stories. And, and, and even with hopefully with the passing of Congressman John Lewis, our attention will be drawn back to the many ways that he fought um, and the people that he fought for, for equal, equal rights and, and just for people of color to be not only included, but to be elevated in so many ways um, so that we can continue to live and do what God's called us to do. So my prayer is that even as we celebrate and honor his life, we'll move back into this conversation. But in my heart of hearts, I haven't gone anywhere since the last time. Because I'm hearing the Lord say to me that we must, the church must have a kingdom response to racism and erasing this terrible blight of racism in our world. It must be a, a main part of our message. In other words, everything we say, the way that we live, we are living epistles, but it also must be our mandate. It must be a priority in our lives. It's our message and our mandate to erase racism. And if this is going to happen, there's a few things that we've got to dig into. And, and I don't know how long it's going to take me to do this. So I'm going to use the time that I have allotted today to go at it. And then whatever I don't get to, we'll just pick back up the next time and just work on this a little bit because I believe it's going to be vital for the transformation and the change that we really desire to see in our nation. I don't know about you, but I'm praying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. 
Lord, bring your peace, bring your revelation to this nation. And the only way we'll be able to be healed um, from, from the vestiges of the terrorizing impacts of racism on our country is if the church takes the lead. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So if we are going to be to have a kingdom response to racism, I only got two points a day. And I want to start with my first. My first point is this. We, beloved, we must stand against racism. We must take a solid. We must take a serious. We must take a, um, a, a stand against racism that that lets everybody know in the room and outside of the room that we're, we're serious about this and we're not going to have it. We're not going to allow it, not on our watch, no longer in our time. We must stand against racism. And this is simple. I know this may sound elementary to some of you, but I, I, I've got to speak these words. Racism is sin. So we've got to stand against it. As we're told, we're told in the Bible that and I love this passage in Psalm chapter one, verse one. We're told in the Bible that we are blessed when we don't agree with, we're blessed when we don't align ourselves with it. We're blessed when, when we don't stand in the way or we stand alongside of sinners or, or the sin that they promote. And racism is a sin. And anyone who promotes racism, anyone who executes or, or lives a racist life, any, life, anyone who would buy into systemic racism and injustice, the Bible tells us that we must stand against them. We must align ourselves against them. I'm not, I'm not on your side because God is not on your side when it comes to this matter. Let's look at it real quick. Psalms 1.1. You know, I learned it in, in King James that blessed is a man um, that, that walked not in the counsel of the ungodly or standeth in the way of sinners. But in the CEV, it reads this way. God blesses those people who refuse evil advice and won't follow sinners or join in sneering at God. My Lord, I love the way it says, it says we won't follow sinners. We're not going to, to, to stand with them. We're not going to align with anyone who's not aligned with God's heart. So, so what we need to know, beloved, is that we must stand against racism. And we must stand with God. We've got to do it this way. God only will, will only be blessed. We lo I love this passage because later on in Psalms 1, as you know, it says when we, when we stand with God, when we stand against evil, the Bible says we'll be like a tree planted by streams of water. That water is going to keep us alive. And it says that we'll, we'll give fruit, we'll bear fruit in our season. But then it says even when we might not be bearing fruit in our season, it says our leaves will not wither. We'll always have green leaves. Hallelujah. And then it says, amen. This is another message. I call it God's blank check. He says, whatever this type of person does will prosper. So if you want to prosper in life, if you want to be prosperous in the way that you carry out your life and the way that you display your Christian faith, like I desire to be, we've got to stand against racism. Amen. David declared also his allegiance to the Lord. In another passage, I, I'm, I'm reading, you know, I'm always talking about my favorite passages, but Psalm 139 is really one of my favorites. I've actually committed it to memory, um, but I want to read it from the message translations today to talk about um, how David saw his relationship with God in connection with what was going on all around him and in the world. And in particular, we can talk about as we're talking about racism. Listen to what David says um, with his relationship with the Lord. He says, see Psalm 139 verses 17 through 22. He says, see how I hate those who hate you. I hate those who hate you, God. See how I loathe all this godless arrogance. I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my enemies, my Lord. In other words, David was saying, God, I'm against what you're against. And we, beloved, can be sure when it comes to racism that God is against it. God is against racism. He's against systemic racism and he's against prejudice and injustice against people. 
Why? Because God created, he created us. He created humanity. And God wants us to live that way and to stand that way with him. As a matter of fact, I, I, by now, some of you are saying, well, well, pastor, you got to show me a little bit more. Well, I, well I, I love to show you in the scripture another place that's interesting to me. And, and, and there's a specific reason I want to um, share this with you, where in the book of Numbers, beginning with verse one, God shows his displeasure with Miriam and Aaron. Miriam, Aaron and Moses were the three. Lead, they were the top tier of leadership with all of Israel. There's another passage that talks about this. Moses, Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. Yes, a female in leadership, even in the Old Testament. I'm not going to even go there today. That's another message, but I'm going to come back to it. But God here shows his displeasure with Miriam and Aaron when they complained against Moses because of his wife. Well, why did they complain? I'm glad you asked. I want you to read this one for yourself. Um, I want you to I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 12 and I want you to read it with me beginning at verse one. Why? Because um, I want to get the word into you as we read the word. We we get it into us. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. But secondarily, I want to emphasize something that we're not usually taught in our Christian experience. I want to emphasize that there is an undeniable black presence in the Bible that predates. Listen to me. The black presence in the Bible predates slavery in America. Thus, fact checking the claim that it is um, Christianity is the white man's religion um, Um, is not true. It couldn't be true when the Bible was written before um, the white man introduced um, the Bible even to the slaves. And of course we know they they perverted the scriptures and they contorted the scriptures to adjust to what they believed about not not identifying and not um, um, making sure that, that all men were created equal. That was their error. And it needs to be erased more than just pulling down statues and monuments. We need to dig and erase into the fabric of America, including the Christian church to deal with. Hallelujah. The things that we have not dealt with in years. So the question is, why did God check Miriam and Aaron? You ready to read it? Why did why did why was God displeased? Let's read it. You've got to You've got to see this. I like it in the New King James Version. Um, it's just a powerful passage. Numbers chapter 12, verse one. All right. Are you there? I said, are you there? Hallelujah. I'm saying that so I can get there. It says, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, some translations, some of the, the older translations that use the word Cushite. Um, The word Cushite means a descendant from the land of Cush. The land of Cush, Cush was one of the descendants of Ham, Noah's son, and, and, and they settled in the region of Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan. So I want you to just think about not you don't have to go all the way back to the Bible days, but think about someone that you may have ever seen who's Ethiopian, someone that you may know who's Sudanese. They are people of color, matter of factly, black people. And here, Miriam and Aaron, my Lord, are are complaining, speaking against Moses because of specifically because of his Ethiopian, his black Cushite wife. My Lord, my Lord, I might be getting in trouble here, but but I I know the Lord's leading me. So I'll just take that. Amen. And I know by now some of you Bible scholars are questioning where I'm going with this. So I challenge you, those of you are scholarly and, and, and you're not tracking with me. I challenge you to study it for yourselves and then write me, write to me on this. Pastor Kerwin at PasadenaChurch.com. So that I can hear your take on this, this passage in particular, but I'm quite aware that there is more here to be explored, but I submit to you that this reason can stand against such scrutiny. 
They were complaining because Moses' wife was an Ethiopian. Now we know, again, we know that when it comes, and I've taught that when it comes to complaining or anything that, that we, we, when we um, complain against others or anytime we're prejudiced or injustices or the, the, the negative, terrible things that we do to others is really because we got a problem with God. And of course, as you continue to read the story, Miriam and Aaron really had a problem with God choosing Moses as the top leader. And they really had a problem with God speaking as the Lord says himself face to face with Moses. He says to the prophets and other people, you know, we go, I go around with them a little bit, but since he says, Moses is my boy, I'll speak to him directly because of the relationship we have. But it is identified here as their original complaint was because his wife was black. My Lord, my Lord. So what do we do? We stand against it. What did God do? God stood against their prejudice. God called him, said, come on, let's talk the three of us. And when he got the three of them together, you've got to read numbers 12 for yourself. But, but when he got them together, then he said, okay, Miriam and Aaron, y'all come, y'all come a little closer. And, and they did. And the Lord spoke to them and he, and he, and he checked them and told them how things are, why Moses is his selection. And then the Bible says when the cloud lifted, Miriam's skin was white. It was leprous. It was it. She, she had a, a terrible skin disease when the Lord's cloud lifted from them. It scared Aaron so bad that he cried out and, and begged Moses to forgive them and, and ask, tell Moses to ask the Lord to heal them. There's a lot in there. It's a lot in there. And the Lord eventually did. But he did check them. That's my point. And it proves that God takes a stand against the things that he knows and he and he says are not right. And that is when we mistreat people, especially because of their race, the color of their skin. I've got to move on to my second point. We must stand against racism. But secondly, I, I want to say to you that we must support. We stand against racism, but then we must support God's plan for man. We've got to align ourselves with God. We've got to say, Lord, your way is the best way. And whatever you say, the direction that you lead, the way that your word guides us, that's, that's how we uh, position ourselves to make sure that we're going God's way and not against God. So we support God's plan for man. And the good news is that God wants us to, he wants us to know his plan and he wants us to follow his plan. The challenge, of course, for us, and especially when it comes to, to racism and prejudice and injustice, the challenge is usually our upbringing and our past history. These things often prevent us from seeing things God's way. My Lord, my Lord. There's another passage in the Bible in the New Testament, the book of Acts um, chapter 10. So I want you to turn to that. We'll spend a little time here before we close. Because in Acts chapter 10, we have a story here of how the Lord uses um, a vision to convince Peter, the apostle Peter, that God's plan of salvation was not just for the Jews, but for everyone. It's found in Acts chapter 10 versus um, the, the whole the whole chapter. But I want to pick up the story in Acts chapter 10, verse 27 through 36. Before we read it, let me just let me just bring you up. The Bible says that Peter was was um, at Simon the Tanner's house and and he was they were hungry. He was waiting for them to to prepare um, food for him, prepare a meal for him. And while he was waiting, he went into a trance. He had a vision. And in this vision, um, in this vision, the Lord lets down a big, like a, a, a big spread, like a big tablecloth. And there were all types of animals represented on that tablecloth. And then the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill or slay and eat. The Lord tells Peter to, 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 to eat from this table. Many of those animals represented according to Jewish customs were to, and to Peter were unclean and uncommon. And the Lord is saying, I want you to eat from this table. And, and Peter says, I can't do that. And then the Lord says, well, anything that, that I declare clean is clean. 
And he does that three times. So then we pick the story up here because while Peter's having this, this vision, the beginning of the chapter tells us about a man named Cornelius who was a Gentile. But God sent an angel to speak to him. He was recognized by God as one who was faithful in prayer. Watch this and giving. So the angel says, Cornelius, the Lord, the Lord has something for you. And Cornelius yields to the Lord. He sends some of his men to some of his men to go to go get Peter as the Lord commands. And as he does this, we find um, Peter. Peter, because of this vision that he has when he wakes up from it and these men are at the door, he goes with them. And now we pick it up here in Acts chapter 10, verse 27. They begin to talk and it says Peter's now at Cornelius's house talking things over. They went into the house where Cornelius Cornelius introduced Peter to everyone who had come. Peter addressed them. You know, I'm sure that this is highly irregular, Peter says. Jews just don't do this. Visit and relax with people of another race. But God has just shown me that no race is better than any other. So the minute I was sent for, I came. No questions asked. But now I like to know why you sent for me. That's interesting for me because the Lord has shown Peter all of this. But uh, even after he makes this profound statement that the Lord um, does not respect any particular race, then he asks, I'm wondering, why did you why did you call for me to come to you? Verse 30, Cornelius said, four days ago, about this time, mid afternoon, I was home praying. Suddenly there was a man right in front of me flooding the room with light. He said, Cornelius, your daily prayers and neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. I want you to send to Joppa to get Simon, the one they call Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner down by the sea. So I did it. He says, I sent for you and you've been good enough to come. And now we're all here in God's presence, ready, listen to this, ready to listen to whatever the master puts in your heart to tell us. They, they were ready. They were eager, even though they didn't know it. They were eager to receive the gospel, the good news, the power of God unto salvation. My God, Peter fairly exploit, exploded with his good news. He said, it's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere among everyone. My God, my God. Peter realizes that even though his past says that anything um, common or, un or unclean, we don't mess with. The fresh word that came down from heaven from the Lord says, no, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. You see, beloved, my, my point here is there must be a realization, an acknowledgement, an understanding of God's righteous and divine purpose for man. And there are times when that goes above it, it goes beyond, it expands even that which we think we know. God was saying, Peter, are you sure that's right? He said it three times. He showed Peter the vision three times. And while Peter's pondering and all of this, these men come to the house. But Peter realizes that 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 God is no the, the I like the way the old translation says God is no respecter of persons. Then he begins to preach the gospel before he finishes his sermon. You got to read it for yourself. Before Peter even finished speaking, the Holy Ghost comes in and starts the altar call. Hallelujah. They begin speaking in tongues and praising God, verifying. Hallelujah. That God has a plan for man that we often um, have not aligned with or, or it, we, we might not see yet. And there are those, there are some people with racist views and racist hearts because of their upbringing, because of what they've been taught. They can't even see. And, and, and there are some even in the church of God, God's church, they can't even see and realize um, that these types of upbringings and privileges that they've been afforded can be detrimental to others. 
but God knows and he's going to get, get us there. The point here is that God prepared the hearts of the Gentiles to receive him. The greater lesson was that God was removing the blinders off of Peter so that he could get with God's program. Amen. That's my word for you. We've got, if we are going to, to erase racism, we've got to get with God's program. We've got to stand against it, but then we've, we've got to make sure that we're supporting God's plan for man and not our own. As, as, as we take on this task in closing of erasing racism, we must again, first decide to stand against racism. Then we must support God's plan for man, not what we think, not what we've been taught, it must be what God has decided. Will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you right now for my brothers and sisters, those watching this program today. I pray for anyone, Lord, who, who has struggled with um, a racist heart, anyone who has had an upbringing that has denied them the privilege of enjoying other people groups and other races and having um, diversity in their lives that would, would have made them better and not bitter. And I pray for those who have been hurt and disparaged because of, of, of racist people and systemic racism that has impacted every aspect of, of our lives. We pray, God, for your healing. We pray, Father God, that as we stand in you and stand with you, that you will show us the way to dismantle this terrible, this terrible system of racism in our country and in our world and even in our hearts. We ask that you would forgive us wherever we have erred, Father, that, Lord, you, you don't only erase the sin from our lives, but the Bible says you throw it away in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. So we ask you to forgive us, to heal us. And, and if you're here today, my friend, and you're praying this prayer with me and you haven't asked Jesus into your heart, it's a simple prayer. You can pray it aloud with me right now. Just say this, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Savior and my Lord. All that I am, I give to you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. And I declare from this day forward, I'm yours. I'm going to live the rest of my life for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, thank you for joining us. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, this is what I want you to do. I want to make it as easy as possible. I want you to text the words without any spaces. I, the letter I, I believe, text I believe to 626-602-1165. And we'll send you some more information. We just want to walk with you. We want to make sure that you make it. You're making a decision to follow Christ and we want to walk alongside with you as you grow in the things of God. The other way you can do this is by going to our website, PasadenaChurch.com. And on that front page, you'll see a, a box that says decision, decision card. If you open that box, you can fill out the information of, of the decision you're making to follow Christ, to renew your relationship with Christ. You may simply just have a prayer request. We receive those prayer requests. We pass them on to our intercessors and we pray for you. We pray with you concerning these things as well. So we want you to do that right now. And then if you're a first time guest, is this your first time joining us or you are a frequent visitor of, of, of our program, Pasadena, Pasadena Church, we'd like for you to text the word hello to that same number, 626-602-1165. And this way we can just stay connected with you. We can let you know of anything that's happening with our church or our ministry that you might want to participate in or, or be involved in. And we love to keep that connection with you. We also do that with our church family members, passing a church fam. If you haven't done so, we like you church family. If you're a member of Pasadena church, text the word member to that same number. And then you'll get another prompt to fill out some information so that we can stay connected with you and let you know what we're doing in the city, in our community, and how we're serving um, greater Pasadena area. And then for everyone, you can always join us in prayer on our United Prayer Line. We have prayer every Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern, 
6 a.m. If you join us, amen, you call the number below 609-663-5949. You'll hear someone leading us in prayer. You'll also have an opportunity at the end of that prayer to, to give your own prayer request. And we even share praise reports because as we pray, the Lord blesses, he heals and he delivers. And we love sharing those victories with one another. So please join us for a united prayer line. And then if you'd like to give and support this ministry, many people ask and they write and say, well, how can we be a blessing to the church? Because you've been such a blessing to us. You can always give um, several ways through our website, Pasadena church.com um, if you're, you're you're computer savvy but we also have made it easy to give through the various giving apps that are, are pretty common right now the first one is Zelle if you go to if you have the Zelle app you can just type in info at Pasadena church.com that's our Zelle account and when you give through Zelle there's no fee so that's a blessing for us you can also give through the cash app and our cash app tag is Pasadena Church. And then, of course, you can always send in a gift through snail mail, Pasadena Church, 404 East Washington Boulevard, Pasadena, California, 91104. More than anything, we always say to people, we thank you for your support. We thank our church members for your tithes and your offerings specifically. But if you're going through a difficult time and you don't have it to give, we don't want you to feel bad. We don't want you to, to pull away because you can't. We believe the Lord's going to bless you at the proper time to be able to give in the ways that you so desire. But for now, just know that we love you. We're supporting and praying for you as well. And finally, I want to mention a very important meeting that's getting ready to happen um, today. It is a Church of God town hall meeting. For those of you who know our background, we, we came from a denomination, a group called the Church of God Reformation Movement. And, and there's going to be a town hall um, today that I like everyone who possibly can to call in, to, to, to join in on Facebook. It's going to be on Facebook at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and you can go to the Facebook page, Church of God Ministries, Anderson, Indiana. Church of God Ministries, Anderson, Indiana. And the reason I'm, I'm lifting this up is because um, we've come from this group, the Church of God. I think it would be important for you to hear the perspective of this ministry and, and to see how they are dealing with um, a very serious issue within the Church of God that's impacted a whole lot of denominations. Within our movement, we still have, I'm going to say it, we still have a white church and we still have a black church. Two different organizations, two different groups. We love each other. We hang out sometimes and do a few things together, but we are still separate. So I'm interested in seeing how the leaders of these groups are going to deal with this in light of where we are in a nation. So I'd like for you to join in and maybe we'll have some discussions about it at a later time. That's Church of God Town Hall meeting this afternoon, this evening, 2 p.m. If you're watching our, our evening broadcast, you can go back and rewatch the Facebook event um, through Church of God Ministries, Anderson, Indiana, their Facebook page. Amen. So thank you again for being with us. We always have a good time with you. And as we go, we're going to go back into that song that Sister Yukumi was leading, No Not One. We're going to let the band um, shed a little bit on it as we just worship the remainder of the day together. God bless you. We hope to see you again soon. Two, three, here we start to chip. Come on, everybody, clap your hands. Tell somebody you'll never find a friend like Jesus. There's not a friend like him. Yeah, you can search far and wide, high and low. You'll never find a friend. Not one, not one, not one. You will never find a friend. Can y'all sing that with the choir? You will never.
just 